introducing today's speaker in today's event, which is Intelligence Challenges in a Volatile World. Presentation by David Shedd is the president of Daniel Morgan Academy, Ambassador Joseph Detroit. Thank you, Frank. Thank you. Uh, thank you for all being here. It's, it's great uh, to be here. We're very fortunate to have David Shedd with us today. So this is a very special uh, afternoon for us, David. Thank you for joining us. Uh, let me just uh, uh, introduce two of our key players at the Academy. Abby Moffitt, who's our chairwoman of the Board of Trustees, and Diana Davis Spencer. Thank you for the great support you provide to the, uh, the Academy. You know, uh, the Academy, we're going through a second year, and uh, the focus here is national security issues, and what, how appropriate this is to have David Shedd here to talk about some of these issues. And this is who we are, this is what we do. This is what the curriculum is all about. This is what the scholar practitioners are teaching in the classroom. These are the issues that are confronting this country. And there are many, and we see this in the, from the media each day, whether it's the Middle East and terrorism, whether it's Syria, Afghanistan, Iraq, whether it's the South China Sea, the East China Sea, issues that relate to China, issues with the Soviet Union, the former Soviet Union, Russia, revanchism, and what it means for NATO, drug trafficking, organized crime. This is a man who knows Latin America so well. There's so many issues. And this is what we try to do with these series of speakers, distinguished speakers, who come in and speak to these events. And it fits into the curriculum in a profound way because the students leave this room and they go and they talk about the issues that are discussed. No matter what they're studying, they will talk about these issues. So we're so grateful to speakers like David Shedd coming because it's part of our curriculum. It's part of what we are and what we're doing. Listen, David Shedd, Deputy Director, former Deputy Director of the Defense Intelligence Agency, a distinguished career. And let me just say a few things. I know you have the readouts and so forth. David Shedd has served 31 years in the U.S. intelligence community. He was named Acting Director of the Defense Intelligence Agency from August 2014 to January 2015. Following four years, I emphasize four years of service as Deputy Director of the Defense Intelligence Agency. Mr. Shedd previously served from May 2007 to August 2010 as the Director of National Intelligence Deputy for Policy plans and requirements. David and I work together, and I know what this man does, and I've seen him every day in that job, and he's just outstanding. From 2005 to t April 2007, David Shedd served as the Chief of Staff and later Acting Director of the Intelligence Staff to the Director of National Intelligence. This man was a plank holder with the, the first Director of National Intelligence, John Negroponte. So this, if anybody wants to talk about the DNI and what that means and uh, the intelligence, Act of, uh, of 2004 and the establishment of the ODNI. This is the man who knows it. Prior to the creation of the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, Mr. Shedd had intelligence policy positions at the National Security Council from February 2001 to May of 2005. He served as the NSC Special Assistant to the President. I emphasize that Special Assistant to the President and Senior Director for Intelligence Programs and Reform. This is, these are unbelievable positions. Very critical positions. Key advisor to the president at that time, President George W. Bush. From 1984 to 2001, Mr. Shedd served in the Central Intelligence Agency as an operations officer, was posted overseas in U.S. embassies in Costa Rica and Mexico. A variety of senior jobs at the CIA to include Chief of Congressional Liaison. David, we're honored to have you here today and look at the audience you have. We're so, we're so grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Indeed, good afternoon. Uh, it is a, a delight to be here, uh, and I am absolutely delighted not to say this at the expense of those over the age of 35, <laughs> but I will anyway to see so many young people. <laughs> I hope that um, in the course of what I have to say, you're thinking about questions or remarks that, uh, or comments that you wish to make uh, as, as I go through some, uh, some topical issues that I think are informed by the past, but are yet to unfold in terms of our future. And I think that, that uh, as you saw from the, the marquee of what today is about, I am absolutely passionate 
about looking at the future, again, informed by our past, but not wedded to our past. The key point is that our intelligence customers have a right to demand much from an intelligence community that uh, to the taxpayers is somewhere in the order of $65 billion, maybe approximating $70 billion. When you take two major lines of, uh, of, of uh, funding, which comes to the National Intelligence Program, which is what underwrites the, uh, the funding for the intelligence community of 16 agencies to include the office of the DNI that Joe spoke about in its creation in uh, the Intelligence Reform and Terrorism Prevention Act of 2004, but really stood up around May of, uh, of 2005. And then the military intelligence program, which is really under the, the uh, stewardship of the Undersecretary for Intelligence and the Department of Defense. So, so when you combine that, it's approximately $70 billion. The challenges, however, are absolutely extraordinary in terms of what our nation faces. You cannot pick up, for us old timers, a newspaper, or look at the media for those old timers and young people <laughs> in whatever form you get your news. Uh, and most recently, uh, as we have seen in the, in the course of events uh, in Orlando, uh, as we look abroad, and as Joe did a very quick synopsis around the globe, uh, the instability that we see around there. So the, 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 the bottom line here is that our customers, the President, the Congress, the combatant commander, the chief of police uh, of major cities expect nothing less but a performance by an intelligence community to deliver a currency called intelligence information that provides them options that create a decision advantage. Everyone follow that? To create a decision advantage. That is, having knowledge of something that the adversary doesn't know that you know. I will violate my own rule uh, and offer two taglines for today that I hope that you can take away from uh, today's remarks. Tagline, uh, tagline number one comes in the form of a question and will come full circle in terms of application to this question as, as we go through uh, the next 20-25 minutes before taking your questions. But the question is as follows. Are we already in or entering into a technological exponential age? Let me repeat that. Are we entering or are we, are we already in a technological exponential rate, uh, age? Where the rate of change of technology, and those who know of Moore's Law, is at easily 2.0, if not beyond that. In 1998, and I'll just read these statistics very quickly, Kodak had 170,000 employees. Uh, 1998, not that long ago, 170,000 employees and sold 85% of all photo paper worldwide. Bankrupt as a business model in just a few years. Software will disrupt most traditional industries in the next five to 10 years. I would say it's already occurring. Uber software, but no cars owned by Uber. Airbnb is now the biggest hotel company in the world and does not own properties. Artificial intelligence. IBM's Watson provides 90% accuracy in basic legal advice. For those lawyers in the room, <laughs> Watson provides at a basic level legal advice with 90% accuracy compared to 70% accuracy for human provided legal advice. Think about that. Watson's diagnosis of cancer is four times more accurate than human diagnosis. That's artificial intelligence. And we're just at the tippy tippy point of where that aspect is going. So Siri, Watson, and versions that will continue to, to uh, Unfold. Autonomous vehicles will redefine car ownership, insurance, <coughs> urban living, and so on. This is just but a small sampling to set the stage against which we have to view the world and how it applies to intelligence. So tagline number two, and I promise there's only two. The first one was in the form of question. The, the, the second one is in a declarative statement. 
and it is as follows. Bureaucracies will choose failure over change. <laughs> oh, there must be some bureaucrats in this room. <laughs> Lift it. Bureaucracies will choose failure over change unless dot, dot, dot. And we'll talk about what comes to finish that sentence. The most obvious thing is, of course, leadership, uh, risk-taking, the ability to look at the past and be informed by it, yet not live in the past, as I said already. See, there has been a decisive shift from a dominant position for the public slash government sector to the private sector. Uh, as the examples that I gave, the public sector does not control either the type of technology innovation by and large, and much less the pace of it. So autonomous vehicles, artificial intelligence, genetic uh, engineering and biotechnology, cyber, quantum computing, Internet of Things, uh, imagery resolution and revolution, drones, 3D, now 4D printing. You see, we're in a world in which was predominantly for many decades a world in which that was developed in the research and development sense of the word in the government space. And by extension, the pace of its development was controlled by government, and therefore by extension, the usage of it and the uh, purveying of that technology to customers, if you will, outside of government space was controlled, <coughs> gone. You see, against that backdrop, bureaucracies will choose failure over change by saying we can still do it inside government. Now, that isn't to say it can't do anything. There are the DARPAs and the IARPAs. For you young people, look up at the acronym and it'll tell you more or less what their mission is. They do some extraordinary things. But if you talk to the head of IARPA, which I've done recently with um, Jason Matheny, it is very clear that it's done in partnership with the private sector with a preponderance of what they're actually doing done with the private sector. So it's an InQtel-like model called IARPA in terms of where they're headed with big data and big data analysis and big data intelligence. So let me turn a little bit to the diversity of the threats that we face against which uh, we and our friends and allies uh, face enormous national security challenges. The globalization, I argue and maintain, of technology has democratized information and technology <clears throat> to the point that greater complexity rather than less exists by way of the challenges that we face in terms of the threats to our nation and to our friends and allies. Countries that used to be technologically backward or certainly technologically incapable can now benefit from advanced technologies much faster that are either similar or very close to the very top developed technologies of top tier countries such as ourselves. All without having to make a significant research and development investment some steal it, others just buy it, legally and openly. And because these countries can present a much higher threat than they used to, they effectively enter the tier one countries through technology, sometimes and mostly through a front door, but many of them also through the back door, and demand our higher prioritization and intel resources to track the countermeasures that uh, come with those capabilities that these nation states, and as we well know, the non-nation states acquire. There is then a convergence, think about this as you think about the globe, of regional or functional technology threats then, that emerge from that. A different threat matrix than the one that certainly <coughs> I can speak to my early part of my career of the 1980s and even into the 1990s in terms of what a CIA mission consisted of. It is no longer sufficient to have an intel officer only with the regional expertise. That officer needs to be well versed in technical disciplines <coughs> to be more productive, if not completely productive. It presents a conundrum. For you young people, do you go the generalist route or do you go the specialist? And I would argue it's a hybrid. 
the private sector can certainly help uh, shape that in terms of the investment that you make in terms of your career development. And now the adversaries understand our reliance on technology for conducting military operations and they seek to exploit that reliance and remove us from our own comfort zone <coughs> of believing that we have in fact um, have control of that, uh, uh, of, of that uh, effort. Take the F-35, for example, the most advanced aircraft ever produced. It is at, um, at milestone decisions, which is just a fancy word for saying goals and objectives by a certain point in its production. It is consistently a year or years behind already before the adversary is already uh, adapting to aspects that the F-35 has. That's how quickly the world's changing and it's how quickly our adversaries are adapting accordingly. So this is obviously not a go around the world and tell you this is the threat in North Korea versus Iran versus Syria and Iraq and ISIL and uh, Al Qaeda, the Al Nusra Front, et cetera, et cetera. I'm happy to talk about those. I'd much rather that you apply critical thinking, critical thinking against these threats in this relatively new brave world that we're looking at. The key point is that technology at a cost point is getting cheaper by the day. Allow me some freedom in saying that. Obviously not every technological piece, but relatively speaking to where we were even a decade ago is much cheaper. And the market, market entry is uh, enabled by commercial R&D and applications and no longer principally under government control. That's the bottom line of this uh, scene setter. So some additional points that I would like to underscore here. The access to technology used for military applications, and this is something that was drilled into me in my experience at DIA, emboldens, actually emboldens our adversaries to get into a confrontation earlier and more deeply with us as a result of feeling that they have parity vis-a-vis -vis us. Now, think of war in the gray. Think of where the challenge is as a challenge of confrontation as opposed to World War II, per se, or the Vietnam War, or think of a less traditional model of what that confrontation looks like in that statement that I just uh, made would be absolutely true. The, the likelihood of confrontation increases as the level of a sense of confidence goes with it by way of what technology brings to our adversaries. And in so doing, some of our adversaries, as we look around the globe, whether state or non-state actors, seek to challenge our American <coughs> leadership in the world, and I will not get into the U.S. side of leadership or lack thereof, that's not the point here. They will challenge it. That is, in fact, the point. Cyber enables, again, these adversaries by the stealing of intellectual property rights and property technology, and the adversaries don't have to spend uh, any or they spend very little in the R&D by simply stealing those property rights to reduce their time and weaponization and other aspects of their capabilities in operationalizing them. So the asymmetric threat increases from adversaries due to this low price of entry, giving intelligence then a much bigger challenge in detecting it and then giving policy, uh, policy members of the, uh, of the policy community more options in terms of or looking at options for countering uh, the threats. And so in the end, to sum up this commentary on the portion of technology is the adversaries seek from their perspective to create a level playing field with the United States, our friends and allies, whether it be in the weapons capabilities or their intelligence uh, underwriting or undergirding those, uh, the, the, the systems that they use. Regarding the impact of these emerging technologies it is a key that it, what is available to us is increasingly and available then to our adversaries. That is the main point. This change in technology landscape actually levels the technological level playing field between the U.S. and our allies, with our allies against our adversaries 
in a, con uh, in a conflict. They, can, they do and are intended to take what the intelligence community, the defense community calls COTS. Everyone know what COTS is? Commercially off the shelf capabilities, right? This is the technology that's readily available and then they weaponize it or they use it. Think of drones. Think of the capabilities of 3D printing. Think, of, think creatively about what an adversary can do with that at a relatively low cost. And then those same adversaries can very readily proliferate that technology adaptation to other partners in, in their efforts to challenge the United States, our friends and allies. The dual use nature of many technologies makes it increasingly difficult to control and yet another intelligence challenge in terms of detection and then the ability to stop that uh, that that sharing of, of technology among the adversaries. Near-peer competitors by 2020, 2025 in certain areas of weaponization like Russia and China proliferate dual-use technology in order to enhance their revenue streams. So let me give you an example of where we are incredibly challenged. And this comes more out of my DOD experience by way of the Defense Intelligence Agency than it does out of CIA, although clearly CIA would have uh, an intelligence interest in both the collection and analysis of this. And it is in the area of anti-access area denial, A2AD. You hear those terms and you young people will hear it a lot more. What it essentially does in its essence is deny US capabilities into the airspace, could be water space, of, of our adversaries. That is our ability to enter and, um, and, and challenge that adversary inside that airspace and out a certain percentage or a certain area that they wish to protect outside of their, their immediate borders. We see this in the application in Syria, for example, where uh, through radar systems, the, the uh, Syrians have been enabled by the Russians to prevent us to go into certain parts of the airspace uh, well beyond deconfliction because advanced radar intelligence capabilities by Russia, in this case an adversary in that immediate area, is preventing that. So Russia pursues technologies and strategies very actively in this area of anti-access area denial. So intelligence is proving critical. In the meantime, the signals that we would call telemetry that comes from all of that is encrypted making it even more difficult in terms of the challenges to collect it and decode it in uh, vernacular language. Several technologies and weapons systems can be bundled and employed as a collective strategy then to prevent that access to that airspace or water space or land space for that matter. The A2AD type strategy multi-layered and multi-pronged is at the core of the Russian modernization program in the military. It's not only effective in preventing the effectiveness of US and allied systems, but more importantly, it affects Washington's decision calculus when it comes to policy choices, right? Because what you've done, instead of working with an entire loaf of bread of options, you've already said, I can't do X because that's already a, a forbidden zone, so to speak, militarily uh, uh, in, a, in the context of the military, and it precludes then certain options to the policymakers if you cannot penetrate that A2 AD. So at points, you may very well make a policy decision that says we will not engage, or the cost of engaging is too high in order to pursue a, a, a campaign to go in, in that direction. So response to the challenges that I've laid out, which has been very heavily technology driven. Are we ready? I would argue no. Um, I think there are uh, very foundational things that have to dramatically change, which I don't want to get into today, but I'm a big believer that the acquisition process, as I've talked about the F-35 system, uh, is, is woefully broken. Uh, it simply is not working to our advantage. It's too slow. It's, uh, it's generally too late 
in terms of how, how you get into it. It doesn't reward innovation coming in uh, by, the, by, the, by the big thinkers, but the small producers to get into that, into that stream of acquisition and so on and so forth. As a rule, I have found that in the 18 months that I've been out and the companies that I'm dealing with is that that COTS, that commercially off the shelf capability is good enough in many instances. I would argue in the vast majority of instances. Let me give you an example. If I am in a counterterrorism environment analytically or even operationally, uh, it's probably a good idea that I not look like a terrorist. It's just a guess. <laughs> to you students, don't go into the deep dark web and look like one of them. The FBI will come a knocking. I'm quite sure. So what do you do? You manage your attribution. You manage your persona in such a way that your ISP is not tied to you. Right? It seems very logical. So I won't promote a certain company that does this but does it very well as a former agency CEO that <coughs> leads it, uh, is able to do uh, marvelous things that hide your ISP. I do a fair amount of travel overseas. I never get on the web using David Arshad, you know, whatever I go to. My web browser, which is this alternate universe, which is a Firefox, it, it, there's no latency to it at all, and it randomly chooses out of thousands of ISPs out there, and I do the search on the name of the person I just looked at or, or had looked <coughs> with, or whatever it might be. Right? I want to hide that attribution. Why would government on God's green earth try and develop that in itself? That makes no sense. Why? Because it requires patches all the time. It needs iOS 10.0 constantly, right? So let the companies do that. Deliver that as a service. Some of that's occurring. A lot, a lot more has to occur. But remember, bureaucracies will choose failure over change unless there's a leadership to drive it. The future challenges and opportunities are indeed enormous. And it is rapidly changing in this revolutionary, back to the question I asked this tagline number one, is it revolutionary? I truly believe it is, uh, at a faster and faster rate. Is the, and by the way, when I say technology is changing, not necessarily everywhere. It's interesting, your airplanes don't go that much faster than they did 20 years ago. It's still about 550 miles an hour at 39,000 feet, depending on which direction I'm flying, right? So I'm saying, where's the really fast airplane? Uh, so it's, it's not everywhere, but certainly in the area of communications and the data handling and data processing, all that, it's revolutionary. What can we do? So let me give you, in closing, seven ideas for action, and by no means are these intended to be ex inclusive to every possible idea to do it, but there's some things that I've, I've thought about and continue to believe would be of high value against the backdrop of what I have described. I think we have to dramatically increase, number one, the public-private industry collaboration. There are enormous challenges in a post-Snowden environment to doing that. So do not let me leave you with the impression we're talking about something that's easy to do, but nonetheless, it's an imperative to do. And by that I mean it is not any longer a, uh, a choice, but a matter of survivability. Because of that dramatic shift that's occurred over the decade, decade and a half to two decades, uh, at, a, at an increasing rate of speed in terms of where uh, innovation's occurring on the edge, we need to be doing that with the private sector. The solutions are far more found there, and then the absorptive capacity where that bureaucracy choosing failure or change has leadership that drives it to that. Secondly, example talent acquisition, uh, the uh, talent acquisition could be modified with hiring practices where the public sector has far more of a rotation into the private sector and vice versa. It's a different uh, HR model entirely to what we have now. Essentially, I have a career, come in, and you're almost, it's less so now than when I came in, but you were seen in the intelligence community for your young people that are looking into uh, potentially a future inside the intelligence community or the defense uh, Title X area of defense intelligence. Um, 
very much of, a, of almost a disloyalty if you leave, because you, you were invited into the club, you joined the club, but now you just sort of, what is it, American Express card when you leave. Mm -hmm. uh, so one of the things I did at DIA was keep the active clearance for seven years to anyone that left. It was low cost, and the probability of a good number of them returning back to somewhere in the intelligence community, not necessarily DIA, was, uh, was pretty high. Because if you go to the very core of the motivation, and I would think that I'm speaking for the students here uh, and the interns, that, that you're really looking at individuals who have, have a passion to serve and make a difference. And the grass may be greener for a while, and that may not be bad, by the way, on the outside, you'll come back. Or a percentage, a good percentage, will come back into service in, in the government, which is an incredibly, incredibly rewarding career. Um, and so had I to do it all over again, I wish I would have known things I've even learned in the last 18 months much sooner, uh, just by way of the experience. Third, government employees obviously would have to be interviewed, selected by industry, would be invited into industry to spend time there, and it would count for joint duty. This is, if you take the Goldwater Nichols version inside the Department of Defense, which uh, uh, really highlighted this uh, cross service, as in the uniform services, having these experiences. I think the civilian side ought to give credit <coughs> for that one year, two year, of where you go to Silicon Valley and come back and maintain your security clearance during that time. And I think that's uh, will encourage greater out of the box thinking within government. Government cannot possibly own all the expertise that the private sector is continually. Producing. And for that, I would argue that what we really need is a, um, a national brain trust, if you will, a reserve that you could tap into individuals who have that private sector experience, don't come in with all the government constraints of a, of a GS schedule. Some of that's done. It's minuscule today. It needs to be increased. Um, in, <coughs> significantly, the Steve Jobs, uh, obviously deceased, but Jeff Bezos and others to come in and do that. How attractive that would be, if it's done the way government does things today, not very really attractive. I understand that. So you have to change the modalities under which it's done. Five, um, we talk a lot about this. I still think that government tends to stifle unconventional thinking rather than reward it. <coughs> the thinking that, that uh, really is out on the edge on how to deal with this critical uh, thinking that, that, that I described. Six, cyber is our single biggest challenge. For those who are sitting toward the back, um, as you think about how you're going to be attractive, I know you're attractive, but being attractive to the ones who would hire you, cyber is going to be an integral demand for years, if not decades to come. That is your ability to play in that space, understand that space, counter uh, intelligence in that space uh, of cyber is going to be critical. Allies and friends need to come together much closer uh, in areas of uh, combating the cyber threats that we face. I am a big advocate taking out of hide inside the intelligence community today and creating an NCTC for cyber. I know there's a small one, capped at 50 and all that. It's not enough. The threat is far bigger and far larger and deeper in the cyber arena. And again, it would tie into this public-private sector um, partnership. Lastly, foreign partnerships. It is time to significantly dramatically increase our dependency and shared responsibilities to counter threats. I would start with NATO and the 28 countries there. I would uh, revisit the uh, Japanese and South Korean agreements, not as in devolving or countering them, but rather building them much stronger in the region. I would invest heavily on India, uh, places around the globe, and you can think yourself, but the partnerships are absolutely against the common threats which are growing. Uh, 
uh, a, a very important aspect to it. That is not at the expense of you know, what we call unilateral human intelligence or unilateral signals intelligence or even unilateral uh, cyber collection. But the partnerships are absolutely critical in terms of the response. So in conclusion, the national security and by extension the intelligence demands are indeed enormous. Many of you certainly sitting about halfway in the room and back are part of that future. And it is not by any means insurmountable to be out on top over the atmosphere. Thank you very much.